The Last Act of Love is a book about the death of your brother. Uh, Matt Haig says it's a brilliant book, uh, harrowing and heartbreaking, but also warm and human and healing. So could you tell us about the tale of what happened to your brother? So when my brother was 16 and I was 17, he was um, a wonderful, tall, funny, smart, clever person. And we had quite a knockabout relationship, but it was funny and great. And then one night uh, he was knocked over by a car and everything about life changed for him. But also for me, I've come to see. Um, he had a very serious head injury and he was operated on. And, of course, all we wanted, my parents and I, would, was that he would live, that he would survive. That's what we were thinking about that night in Lee's General Infirmary. But he didn't, whilst he didn't die, he didn't ever really make any sort of a recovery and he was left in what's known as a persistent vegetative state. He never in any way was the same person again and all he did in his new condition was he had periods of sleep and wake so his eyes would be open and that was really it so for a long time we hoped that some sort of miracle would happen and that if we worked hard enough we might be able to wake him from this state but we never could and um, I've come to see what a cruel and terrible thing it is, both for the person themselves who wouldn't want to be alive like that, but also for the people that surround them. Because it's a very difficult thing psychologically and physical, philosophically to be with the body of someone who's no longer there, but where their body remains. And then I guess you got to the point where you had to make the decision to turn the machine off, and that would be the name of the title, The Last Act of Love. Um, yes, it's sort of if only if it was that easy, really, because people talk about switching off machines, but when you want to end somebody's life in that condition, the only legal way to do it is to remove their feeding tube and then wait for them to die, which took 13 days. And I've come to see that that nobody really sub should be subjected to that, um, not, the, what, not what remains of the person, um, but equally not their relatives and not the people who loved them, and actually not the caregivers who have to look after them. It was quite a moment for me when I learnt that um, that even medical professionals that are surrounded by, you know, that have to do that, have to have counselling because it's seen as a deeply unnatural thing to have to do. But of course the reason we have to do it is we can now keep people alive in a way that we were never able to do before. That, you know, in a, in a, we've made medical progress that we wouldn't have dreamed of, but we haven't caught up with the implications of it. Why did you write it? Did you feel that you needed to? So I started writing the book, um, gosh, only three years ago now, but I tried to do it before. Um, I suppose I just couldn't, the story just wouldn't lie down in me, really. It was always there, always present. I kept trying to write other things. I wanted to write funny novels about, you know, misunderstandings and people having adultery, but it just never worked. I, the um this other story would would intrude and would take it over and I came to see that I had to try to write it. I never really thought anybody would read it because when I started writing it I thought it would just end up in a drawer and it still feels an astonishing miracle to me that instead it's out in the world. Having had all these other people work on it, you know, like my editor and a publisher and and to have people care. You are thoroughly immersed in the book world. Um, you're a contributing editor to the bookseller. So you know that there is a huge market in misery memoirs. I think it probably started with Angela's Ashes and A Child Called It. What is it about other people's misfortunes that is so popular, do you think? Why are people interested in other misfortunes? And again, I think all of art is processing. It's all coping strategies for life, really, as indeed I think is probably all religion and all self-help. So everybody's just working out how to live. And I think a lot of people want to know how they would cope if something terrible happened. Um, I've come to see with my book that the, I, I really know, I'm so surprised people read my book because I, I mean, it's just so grim, isn't it? Why would anybody want to read it? But I've come to see that why people like reading it is that at the end of the day, I'm still here. Um, and I think people possibly find that quite comforting and consoling. So on one level it's a very interesting book, it's a good read, it engages the emotions, it's warm, it's funny in places 
But do you think it does more than that? Do you think it actually helps people? Do people come up to you and talk to you about it? Yes, they do, and I get loads and loads of letters from people. And again, that feels like a complete miracle to me, to have transformed what happened into something that's useful to other people, I think is incredible. I still can't really believe it. Um, What people tell me is that, again, it's that, they feel less alone. Somebody said to me, just a letter I had, I think, yesterday... Um, thank you for normalising my feelings and I'm now off to try and get some therapy and I thought well done you, you know, you go Mm. Um, which is another thing I've realised we in general in our culture we're pretty down on people wanting help aren't we so I think what my book does is it says this happens, it was awful then things were awful for me and then I started looking for help and asking for help and that was a big change and it kind of worked And I I think if anybody else gets that message, you're not alone and it's okay to ask for help, then that would make me feel pleased.